Welcome, brothers and sisters, as we continue in our virtual worship during this coronavirus, coronavirus lockdown, so to speak. And as I mentioned a month and a half ago before it was declared a global pandemic, as we were coming to the close of our journey through 1 John, that we were going to embark on a new journey by the same author and author, our Lord through the Apostle John, a new journey through the book of Revelation, the end times apocalypse. Now, as this pandemic has come to its initial head here on our shores, the question of such an apocalyptic scenario becomes all the more pressing and seemingly relevant. Is this a sign, the beginning of the end? Is this something we've been warned about, like the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse in chapter 6? Is this a cause for panic, run and hide, or run to the hills? Or is this instead a cause for comfort and a call to faithfulness? And as we'll see for John, it is clearly the latter. We see it all the way through, and we see it from the very beginning. The comfort begins where it always must be, the God whom we serve and in whom we trust, the God under whose watch care we live. So I would like us just to pause in worship and sing together, holy Holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful, Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. As I said, we are beginning a series through the book of Revelation, and it's a book of controversy, yes, either as a subject of fixation, you know, to figure out all the details, to know what's coming and when, or a subject ignored. It's too confusing, why bother? But this book is for neither. Believe it or not, it is fundamentally a book of encouragement for the church then and for the church now. For the church then, in a climate of evil politics, economic pressure, and egregious persecution, and for the church now as a, for the church in every age, where the threat of those things constantly converges. This book, this revelation, is a powerful word of encouragement that our God is Lord over all, that Jesus Christ is returning, and that we must walk forward in faithfulness come what may. Now, we may disagree on many of the details, and in a sense, attempting to preach through the book of Revelation is a rather risky endeavor. 
Yet nonetheless, the central message of this book is of such vital importance to the, to the church, to our church. And around that message, we can all heartily say, Amen. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, even as we come now to your word, to this, to this book of Revelation, as we embark on this journey, as we dive our, in and, and delve through this, I uh, just ask that you give me wisdom that I might understand your word more fully, that I might be able to communicate it clearly, that it might speak to the hearts and the souls and the lives uh, of uh, all your saints here who hear your word. May you bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're beginning at Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom. Priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. These opening words of the book of Revelation paint a basic statement of what it is, what it's all about, who we are and who he is. These are the basics of identity that, that coalesce into a call to comfort, a comfort that speaks in three directions. Number one, comfort in the face of persecution. Two, comfort in the coming of Christ. And three, Comfort under the care of Almighty God. And for the book and for our lives, that's a good place to start. So first, comfort in the face of persecution. Because that's the setting out of which this book arises. As we'll see next week in the very next verse, verse 9 of chapter 1, John is writing this book out of his own personal experience of trouble with the empire over his steadfastness in the faith. He was exiled to the tiny island of Patmos just off the coast of Asia Minor, modern-day western Turkey. Persecution had already begun, and it was only going to get worse. We'd seen a spurt of it under the notorious Nero in the late 60s, and it was rearing its ugly head once again under the emperor Domitian in the mid-90s of that first century. This is when John, the last of the apostles, the last of those direct ties to our Lord himself, now about to let go himself. And what will become of the church then? Will it continue? Will it survive? Will it thrive? This is when John received this series of visions for his personal comfort and for the comfort of those churches under his care and for the churches that would spring up throughout the ages and throughout the world. As we see in the sequence in verses 1 to 3, this vision, it comes from God, through Jesus, via his angel, to John, and for the churches. A comfort that comes with a blessing. The blessing that is attached to this book. See, it's, it's not given to us to frighten or, or overwhelm us, but to bless us. Look at verse 3. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. This is the first of seven blessings in this book, and we'll notice how dominant the imagery of seven is throughout. We'll touch on that later. 
But the blessing isn't just on those who read and study it. That's, that's sometimes um, what we get all enamored with, you know, all sorts of head knowledge, uh, getting everything all figured out, all the facts and figures, all the details of the timeline. No, the blessing is on the one who reads and hears and keeps. And that's where we're going to have to hear the call over and over throughout the book. The call on the saints, you and me, to persevere in the faith, to walk forward in faithfulness to our Lord and Savior, regardless of the pressure that is imposed on us or the opposition that is arrayed against us, whether that be political, societal, economic, religious, or a combination of these. We are called to hear and keep, for as it says, the time is near. Hold on to that thought. But as I said, this book was evidently penned during the reign of Domitian. That was the opinion of the second century Bishop Irenaeus, as his testimony has come down to us in his words. Revelation was seen not long ago, but nearly in our own time at the end of Domitian's reign, near the end of the first century. Yes, there had been a vicious spurt of persecution and martyrdoms under Nero before him, but immediately before the writing of Revelation, the emperor Domitian instigated a new wave aimed especially at local Christians of wealth and influence, as the bishop and historian Eusebius from the early 4th century relates in his Church History, chapter 3, paragraph 17, quote, with terrible cruelty, Domitian put to death without trial great numbers of men at Rome who were distinguished by family and career and without cause banished many other notables and confiscated their property, showing himself Nero's successor in hostility to God, unquote. John rightly saw these as the precursor of a more systemic and systematic persecution of those who bear the testimony of Jesus Christ as he describes it in verse 2. And by this time as well, the rise and the draw of emperor worship, especially Fawn, by the way, in the province of Asia, the church, where the churches are to whom he writes, and the idolatrous trappings of the trade guilds, put it in our, to put it in our, in our language, that's all the the small business owners, right? With those cultural pressures to conform in order to stay in business, in order to feed their families, formed an intense economic and political pressure simply to acquiesce to the spirit of the age, to compromise the lordship and divinity of Christ for the lordship and divinity of Caesar, really, or the lordship what might seem more relevant to us today, of the almighty dollar. For John in the church of his day, there was both present sporadic and looming intense persecution along with the pressure to apostatize or compromise, right? Compromise the integrity of the faith which is so common in our own land today or abandon the faith altogether, such believers need a word of comfort and encouragement to persevere as faithful witnesses, like Jesus in verse 5, living under the supreme sovereignty of Almighty God in the certain hope of Christ's return. Well, that was believers then. But what about us now? I mean, we don't have nearly that same kind of pressure. The pressures to compromise or abandon the faith are increasing, to be sure, and many have and many will. But we are nowhere near the level that the earliest church was experiencing and would experience even further in the next two centuries. At least, not yet. But we need to be ready because situations analogous to what we find then and here could lunge up and lurch forward at nearly any moment in time. Think back just a few short years. Seriously. When the caliphate of the Islamic State, ISIS, overran the Middle East with various and vicious tendrils beyond, and the Christians, ancient Christian communities in those regions and lands, 
were forced to endure the most horrific of persecutions that would rival anything revealed in this book. In our own time, let us not become complacent, nor let, it, let ourselves think that we are immune. Yes, we have been blessed with the legacy of Western democracy, founded on godly principles and by principled men. But that legacy cannot be taken for granted. We should value it. We should defend it. But our trust and loyalty must always, first and foremost, be in and to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not to any government, institution, or culture. We have seen in our own land and in this world how much has changed just in the last 25 years, let alone the last five. I'll highlight just a few of these, how we've moved so completely as a culture in a 180 degree turn from the Defense of Marriage Act back to 1996 in which both houses of Congress and the presidency along with an overwhelming majority of Americans enshrined the definition of marriage as between a man and a woman to the imposition through the Supreme Court of legalized gay marriage throughout our land and now how that's been categorically embraced by a majority of all Americans and an overwhelming majority of young Americans who are the future of this republic. And how traditional Christian convictions regarding sexuality are now scorned as bigotry. Where identifying as a Christian has gone from being societally advantageous to being societally disadvantageous. Or with the terrorist attacks on 9-11, how out of the blue that was for all of us. And how that has forever scarred and changed our world and what it means to have and, and to know and to be an enemy. Or with the shockingly deep and polarized chasm of the political divide that we now know as the new normal. That's just a few instances of rapid change, unforeseen. How much will change in the next five years? And change by how much? And so you see, this is not far from any of us. It never has been. We, too, must be ready to face the very issues that John addresses here. But he speaks a word of comfort in the face of that persecution. We need to hear it as well. Then second, comfort in the coming of Christ. This is seen in, in the thematic statements that we've heard from Jesus' own lips in the Gospels and that will return at the end of this book as well, especially what we see in verse 3 when it says, the time is near. And how uh, we come to that dramatic statement and, ho uh, and hope in verse 7 where it says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. That verse is a conflation of Daniel 7.13 and Zechariah 12.10. The Lord, this son of man figure, Jesus, coming with the clouds, returning to those who pierced him. And is it the wailing of repentance? Or is it the agony of judgment? Or is it a little of both? Depending on how you respond to him before and at his return. Jesus used this same mashup in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, when he said, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This, indeed, is the drive and focus of the book. Jesus is returning, and he is returning to make everything right forever. And what does that mean for how I live in the, in the day to day? And especially as I face mounting pressure to, to compromise or abandon the faith. 
Faith in and loyalty to him. If he truly is returning, that is a definite encouragement to persevere through tribulation because everything pales in relation to that. But we also see this comfort in the, in the certainty and nearness of his coming in the very type of writing that the revelation is because it is as it even describes itself, fundamentally a prophecy, though it's couched in apocalyptic imagery and crafted in epistolary form, that is, a letter. Uh, you might even call it an epistolary apocalyptic prophecy. You know, say that ten times fast. Uh, but let us walk through those three descriptors backwards. Letter, apocalypse, and then prophecy. So first, letter. The book of Revelation is, in general form, a letter. We notice that in how it bears the characteristic Christian introduction that we see throughout the New Testament letters of grace to you and peace in verse 4. And then also the typical close of grace. Uh, we see this in the final verse of the book, the final verse in all of Scripture, Revelation twenty two twenty one. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Also, it is specifically addressed to the seven churches of the Roman province of Asia, verse 4, what we'll see in chapters 2 and 3, and that these are not, only, uh, not the only churches intended in this address, but rather ones well known to the apostle John and representative of the church in general is indicated by the use you know, of the number 7, the number of completeness, familiar from frequent Old Testament usage, as well as the testimony from those chapters in which each and every one of the letters to the individual churches is concluded by, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Two, verse seven, and so on, through each and every one. It's addressed to a church, and yet it's addressed to the churches. And this is the beginning of the symbolic significance of the number seven when we're looking at those seven letters to the seven churches, which characterizes the book as a whole. Indeed, it is punctuated, even dominated by four series of sevens. And we'll notice these as we walk our way through. You have seven letters, then you have seven seals, then you have seven trumpets, then you have seven bowls as the prelude to the grand consummation of all things. And one more indicator about its uh, letter intent. It is intended for use in the worship of the church. The letters of the New Testament were characteristically read within the context of corporate worship, and we see direct evidence of that intent here as well. The first of seven blessings in the book is addressed to the one who reads aloud the letter and to those who hear and keep it, verse three. This is the setting of worship a worship we will encounter in various ways throughout the letter, and it is a book best understood in this context, the context of the gathered community of faith. It is a letter to us. And second, apocalyptic. The book of Revelation is communicated through the medium of apocalyptic. Now, apocalypse, apocalypsis, uh, that is, revelation or unveiling is the very first word in chapter 1, verse 1, and by which it is often known, this book. And apocalyptic, though strange to us, I mean, when we read the book of Revelation, it's like, you know, being on drugs or something. But to them, it was a genre of literature quite popular in that ancient milieu, spawned by the continuing situation of the Jewish oppression by foreign powers. It's heyday. Uh, was under the tyranny especially of Greece and Rome. And that genre of literature is characterized by intense and bizarre imagery, visions and angels, end-of-the-world hope in the face of in-the-world despair. It is a medium God used to graphically depict his certain victory and final triumph. And the symbolic character of apocalyptic is a character that is continued here explicitly. If you, when you look at halfway through verse 1, in my translations it says, He made it known. That's more properly, He signified. That is, He made known by means of symbols. It's the verb form of the word for sign. This is a raised flag. 
It lets us know from the very beginning that what we, what we see or hear throughout the book is generally to be understood symbolically, though we may not always understand nor agree about what they particularly mean. So buckle up. We'll see what happens. And third, <laughs> prophecy. So yes, Revelation is a letter, and it's written in the genre of apocalyptic heavy in symbolism. But at its fundamental level, and this is important to note, it is a prophecy. It is expressly called that in verse 3, the words of this prophecy. And we'll hear this underscored another four times in the closing chapter, chapter 22, verse 7, 10, 18, 19. It's a prophecy, as it says in verse 1, about things that must soon take place. Soon, according to God's definition and timetable. Realistically for us, just about any time, whether in the next year or in the next thousand years. And we've got to be ready for either or both. But is this prophecy for them or for us? Are these pronouncements and predictions relevant for them back then or for us as we scan the present and future? And the answer you may have guessed is yes. It was written to real churches in real time and relevant to their time. But also, as we see in verse 7, the focus where that soon event will be and it is always soon, is on the events of the end and the return of Christ and what that return will bring, what it will mean for humanity and eternity. This is in line with the prophetic tradition that so often juxtaposes a near event with a far event, a type with an antitype, like how the prophet Isaiah conflates the promises of the return from the Babylonian exile with the inauguration of the great last days, or how Jesus himself mingles the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 70 with his return at the end of the age. In both cases, the near fulfillment is a type of the ultimate fulfillment. So also we see this same dynamic at work here. The tumults referenced in this book are a type and foretaste of the end. And yet it is likely that the early church, having just experienced the utter devastation of the great Jewish war and the recent persecution by the Roman state, thought of the end as right around the corner. And in every age, it is. For in the coming of Christ has come the last days, begun 2,000 years ago and continuing even now. And from that perspective, his return is always near. There is then a present application with an eschatological end times focus, the return of Christ soon to make everything right as we see once again in verse 7. And then third, comfort under the care of Almighty God. And here we see some wonderful depictions of who he is and who we are under him and by his grace. So first, who he is. As we sang in the opening hymn, he is the blessed Trinity. We see that markedly in the benediction in verses 4 and 5 where it says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. And here we see how we, how we are given the, the blessing of grace and peace from the full Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is described as the one who is and who was and who is to come. And this is reminiscent, perhaps a fleshing out of, of the divine name given back in Exodus 3, verse 14, the I am who I am, uttered by God as the assurance of comfort and deliverance out of the hopelessness of the Egyptian bondage. It not only speaks of his eternality and faithfulness, but his supreme Godness, that he is the sovereign Lord over all history, fully in the present, which is why it starts with who is, but also every bit in charge of both the past and the future from beginning 
to end. This is underscored in verse 8 where it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So, in addition to what we've already heard, God describes himself as the Alpha and Omega, the, the, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, the A to Z, so to speak. It's a similar kind of thing, polar extremes, and to include everything in between. So again, he is the eternal, transcendent one, sovereign over all, and in case you didn't get the message clear enough, he adds one more self-depiction, the Almighty. Nothing is outside his domain, his control. Nothing is too big or too hard for him. Nothing can overwhelm or overcome him. He's not just mighty, because there's a whole lot of those that fill the world. He's almighty. This is fundamental. Fundamental for us to grasp in the midst of all the issues swirling around them and around us. Things that seem so overwhelming and so disconcerting and so worrying. Fundamental for us to grasp and for us to trust. We can trust him because he not only loves us. We'll get to that at the end of verse 5. But he has also graced us, what we'll see in verse 6. But he also has all the power, the omnipotence, the omniscience, etc., to back that up and to bring this world and his plan, including his plan for each and every one of us, to its intended end. And I can trust him in that. I don't know what the end will be for me, but I know that he loves me and that he is almighty for me. Then God to son. I know it's out of order because it goes from Father to spirit to son, but I want to kind of do it this way nonetheless. Um, and there in verse 5, he's referred to as Jesus Christ. And then in his threefold description, we, we see our model. He is the faithful witness he's called first, faithful till death. And we'll see that picked up in chapter 2. Uh, we embrace his rank. He's called firstborn of the dead. That is, in his resurrection, God has exalted Jesus to the highest station, giving him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 9 and 10. Firstborn is a term for rank that comes from the ancient Near Eastern practice of the rights of the firstborn son to inherit and to rule. We see this sense in Psalm 89, verse 27, where God says of David, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And then third, we acknowledge his sovereignty, that third descriptor, ruler of kings on earth. That is, um, through his humiliation and resurrection, and contrary to what we may see or feel or experience, he really is. Again, this calls for confident trust in the midst of a topsy-turvy and ever-so-uncertain world. And then sneaking back into the middle, God the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 4, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. But this is almost certainly a reference to the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. You could even translate it the sevenfold spirit. Because this depiction is nestled between the Father and the Son. And some lesser angelic beings would be unlikely there. And a benediction from God on his people. Which is what these verses are. Verses 4 and 5. And I know it's tautological, but... A benediction from God is only appropriate from God. In fact, the imagery here is drawn from Zechariah chapter 4, where a vision of seven lamps is explained as the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the whole earth. That's Zechariah 4 verses 2 and 10. And then it's further explained by this powerful statement in verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Seven is one. 
seven lamps, seven eyes, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We'll see this imagery of seven lamps and seven eyes and the one spirit return later on in the book of Revelation. And by the way, there's also a sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit that rests on the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. As to the question of why the Spirit is described in this way, I would just say perhaps it is to correspond to the seven churches which John is directly called to address, that the presence of the Spirit is the power of the church, just as the lamp is the light on the lampstands, that, that, the, that, that this is how Jesus is going to describe his churches in verse 20, the very end, last verse of this chapter, as lampstands, but the light, the power, the blessing and presence of God is the blessing and presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We must never lose sight of that. No programs, no tightening things up, not doing things by the way the world might say they ought to go can ever take the place of the Holy Spirit working in and through his people. That's the number one thing in following faithfully after him. But then also and lastly, who we are. And this is the paradox of grace because we are introduced in verse one as slaves. It says, which God gave him to show to his servants, that's all of us, and then also by sending his angel to his servant, John, but that translation is a bit soft. The term doulos is better rendered bond servant or even slave. And yet we are not slaves to almighty Rome or whatever human institution is over us. Even though that's what they seem, we do not serve the world. We are not bound to their beck and call. Rather, we are slaves to almighty God. Remember verse 18, uh, not 18, 8. Verse 8, he's the real almighty and yet, and here's the paradox of grace, we are loved and liberated. We are, we are kingdom and priests. That's what it tells us in verses 5 and 6. Look at the end of verse 5. It says, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. We are slaves and yet loved and liberated. Slaves are not normally loved, but we are. And we are shown the depth of that love in the death of our Lord, that we might be liberated, not from servitude per se, for we all serve someone or something, but rather from sin, transferring us from the dominion of a cruel master to that of a kind king, whom we can love in return. And we are slaves Yet kingdom and priests, it says in verse 6, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Now this imagery of loved and liberated slaves elevated to the position of kingdom and priests is a high honor. First assigned to Old Testament Israel back in Exodus 19 verses 4 and 6. And now it's attached to the church. And yes, there is a sense of present identity and responsibility for us to share with this world that Christ is king and priest. That's our gospel witness through life and lip that he is Lord and Savior. But the focus of this position is the promise of eternity, both intimacy with and reigning with God forever. Chapter 5, verse 10 picks this up and says, You have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That reality is shown at the very end, chapter 20, verse 6, when it says they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years, or as it continues from there, chapter 22, verse 5, they will reign forever and ever. What a truly unparalleled privilege and promise this is can anything in this life anything we might face anything we might have to endure even begin to compare with this grace not one bit so as we begin our trek through the, this final book of scripture god's last word to his church what does he say to us in the midst of this global pandemic, in our climate of increasing uncertainty and threat of persecution, 
Focus your longing gaze on the coming of Christ and commit your life to him, to live for him under the watch care of almighty God. We have a hope and a sovereign. This is our comfort, and that's a good place to start. And it's a good place to stay. Let us close with the hymn, Like a River Glorious. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace Over all victorious in its bright increase Perfect yet it floweth fuller every day Perfect yet it groweth deeper all the way Upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Hidden in the hollow of his blessed hand, never foe can follow, never traitor stand. Not a surge of worry, not a shade of care, not a blast of hurry, touch the spirit there. Stay upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust Him fully, all for us to do. They who trust Him wholly find Him wholly true. Stay upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.